Mm. I'm supportive of collectives that do things the right way. But we are not in the inducement business here. I can't say anybody else has or has not. That I let the general public and things that are out there in the public be what, what it is. All right, welcome in. That was Ward Manuel. Give yourself a couple points, pat on the back, if you knew that was Ward Manuel, the athletic director of Michigan on the Concrete Heroes Pod, talking about collectives, inducements, pay to play, name, image, and likeness. You may have heard of those things. People like talking about that here in the off season because it is a hot topic, and we are pleased to bring on the senior editor, Mays Blue Review. He is on the screen. He's ready to go. And his name is Brandon Justice. Hello, Brandon. Hi, how you doing, Dennis? Appreciate you having me on, as always. Well, it's great to have you on. And, you know, you've been putting in the work on a variety of fronts. Uh, I've been enjoying it. It's your time of year. Uh, baseball, you know, you being the, the, the baseball guy and you're loving baseball. It's, it's really coming through. But uh, I, I see your work on name, image, and likeness, and recruiting. So it's a it's a really good time to. It's always good time, but you know it seems like a great time to have you on right now. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's um, one of those things where this industry kind of uh, gives you a I don't know sort of like an avenue to capitalize on some opportunities. You get some windows, and really it is what you make of it. Um, try to play this whole thing long term, and you know, relationships and all that. So it's worked out good. And we, we've had some good coverage uh, with Maze and Blue Review across all categories. You know, Zach's doing a tremendous job with recruiting and, and Josh is as connected as he's ever been. And um, so things are going good and, and I appreciate it. And look forward to talking to you today about uh, various things. I feel it. I feel the momentum and I see it. Speaking of windows, we've got a window up with our, our call number. You can see that in the, the chat. Uh, we have that available for you. Of course, if you're on Clubhouse listening, you know, we're on before, then we're on with the party after the party. And you, know, you can uh, jump in there and wave, and we got your feedback, and you can get in that way, actually, uh, with your voice as well. So that's uh, that's good for you. like to have that. You know, um, uh, Brandon just mentioned uh, a few of the things that the guys are doing out here. Let me just show you before we jump right into it and tell you why you should join Maze and Blue Review uh, great Father's Day gift, slide the Michigan man in your life, uh, a subscription to Maze and Blue Review. Go to michigan.rivals.com. And uh, this is a story that Brandon just put up yesterday. Uh, actually, it's just a post, you know, and uh, he had uh, eight recruits Michigan feels good about, and he had them in tears. It was really cool. That's just scratching the surface, but you like recruiting. You like the latest on what's going on with Michigan. Of course, uh, Maze and Blue review is uh where it's at uh, i like that story today we are talking about a little uh a michigan football collective and recruiting and up in that right corner of the screen michigan baseball it was their their twitter feed when they won the big 10 tournament and you know i didn't get to ask you about the the wild weekend what last weekend against louisville there was the big blowout it set up for the elimination game and then there was the the weather that forced a delay and then Michigan was in the lead and things were looking good. And then man, the umpires, whether it was the, uh, the second base umpire back there and, uh, and then the home plate umpire squeezing them on a pitch, man, that was a tough way to go down, Brandon. Tough way to go down. Yeah. It's funny, man. Like baseball always goes that way. Uh, I swear almost every game <laughs> goes similar to that. Uh, where it's really just decided in moments and pitches that extend innings, uh, what that can do for you uh, if you're the opposition and what it does against you if you're the team, unfortunately, on the wrong side of things like Michigan, uh, it, it flips the whole game on its head. Michigan was, I mean, whew, that's about as close as you get, right, to, to, to winning that game and still not. Because in, in my opinion, and I know that from a coaching perspective, a lot of my guys watching this will say the same thing, like, you got to control the controllables. The next pitch, don't give up the home run pitch. That was a meat ball. Like both balls that were hit were, were meat. And um, one of them, though, you know, the, the one that really took the, that took the lead for them, that was after the the no strike call. And there's Acuna making his uh, annual appearance. But uh, on the no strike call, the next pitch, he he kind of had to throw a strike. He was in a he he was in a hitter's count, and he had to come back and, and get back from it. He goes to the two two count, and he's really in a spot where he can strike him out. Uh, or I'm sorry, in a one-two count, and he's in a spot where he can strike him out in a pitcher's count, uh, doesn't get that call that was pretty clearly on the outer half, not even outside corner, like outer half. 
Uh, and then the next pitch is two, two. And there's a, you know, he's not, he's trying not to force anything, but he does. And it gets blasted and Louisville wins the game, but we know what it boils down to the call at second base led to the, led to the tie game. And then that pitch led to the lead, it's, you know, and that's just how baseball goes because no, that guy being called safe at second base didn't result in the game being tied right in the play itself. And no, right. that strike, th- that strike three, not being called wasn't a two run call in that moment, but it's both in scenarios, a pitch later. Right. And that's, that's baseball. That's how it goes. Unfortunately, Michigan was on the wrong side of it there. And I think we'll, we'll look back on that for a long time. That was a screw job. If I've ever seen one, I would say. Yeah. Otis saying on the feedback that he still has a bad taste with the favoritism played in baseball. He was out at second Louisville strikes again. Well, they were at home and I complain about replay all the time. And when you look at the guidelines, it is supposed to be irrefutable video evidence. And we know that it's not like that all the time. Sometimes you can go down and and go either way. Now you could make the case that that was so close that that wasn't irrefutable video evidence. I mean, crystal clear, you know, if you'd have a hundred people, all hundred say, Oh yeah, you know, uh, safe or out. So, you know, there, there could have been just a little bit, although it looked very close. It was very close to the standard of, irrefutable video evidence but right the problem is i mean it's not it's like if you if you miss that call without review like that's one thing but you get to review it so i'm to the stage right now and uh i I was last week i didn't really say anything about it but there i was watching the tigers game last night i'm watching these pitches you know they've got the the track and everything this pitch you know the the ball's clearly outside guys going up with the right hand torkelson you know i got you know these guys are all looking back i am ready for ch- after all the thing about irrefutable video evidence and everything, I'm ready for challenges on balls and strike. I am ready to mm-hmm. for them to put a cyclops back there, and if uh, I don't know how many you know they could uh, go with, but I, I, every batter you know gets a challenge throughout the game, and, and if he's ready to do it, I would save mine for a call third strike. But you know, uh, I, I would at least like to see them experiment with it in spring trainings and I don't uh, spring training and I don't care if the uh, umpires are going to get upset uh, about them, you know, being challenged. It should be a, a a guide and a tool that they can use, but I'm ready for that. Uh, I've had enough of these pitches clearly, you know, almost hitting the ground and the guy going up with the right hand. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I, uh, I'm on the opposite side just because, and I know that you're kind of emphasizing it so i get it but i just i hate i would hate robot umps and i would hate like a perfect game because i think i think we've all been there in baseball like we've all been on the side of it where, where it sucks and it takes it takes something away from a special season um for michigan a special postseason run i should say and all that um but we've also all been on the right side of it it's just human error and i think that's my shirt says pastime uh if i can point at it the right way and so i think that's the best way for me to kind of put that in a nutshell. It's just like, this is what baseball has always been. I don't, I, I'm not like a traditionalist in baseball. Uh, I, I like to think like from a coaching perspective, I modernize things a bit, but like I do have some old school foundations. And so from a robot perspective, I would hate that. And I wouldn't want to challenge balls and strikes in a perfect world. Yeah. Because of course, but like, we're not going to get that at the high school level. So to me, probably not kind of, Probably not college either. So to me, it gets to the point where pro development starts to get in question there um, because now you have to teach your pitchers to throw perfect because at that, and I know that it sounds elementary to say that you don't teach your pitchers to throw perfect as it is, uh, but the, the development would change, right? Because at that point now you, you you have to put it in the zone. There's no adjusting to an umpire zone. It's just there. It's one zone fits all. So at that point, I feel like it just kind of has like a butterfly effect where we're going to affect the, the idea is great. The idea is like, Hey, we're never going to have any mistakes on balls and strikes. We're just going to play true to the game. Uh, it's almost like when everyone started switching their fields to turf in a way, right. You can kind of think about it like that, I guess. Uh, but I just feel like there's more of a butterfly effect. You know, I, I think, think about gonna... it in the way that I used to watch tennis and, you know, I'd have John McEnroe yeah. you know, asking me, I have serious and everything else. And they'd say, you know, if they could just go over there and in tennis, they go to the monitor and they look and say, Oh, you know, there it is. It's very hard, you know, the ball spinning, you know, crazy things and everything going on, <laughs> you know, to get it right all the time. And so there's an aid for that. I would like to see it myself. I also think they need to, like, everyone's going to start wearing these gigantic oven mitts because the guy comes sliding in. He's got, you know, six inches on an oven mitt that he's wearing to protect his hand, you know, and it's sliding in there at second base and safe. And the guy barely gets it. It's like, 
wow, you know, your your hand can go from you know six inches to a foot. These guys are going to come out there and start wearing uh, maybe Gumby suits or something while they're sliding. <laughs> I don't know that that's you know those are interesting. I don't know if they're fun things to talk about, and most of the time. Yeah, you are talking about it when something bad happens. Like Michigan, uh, feeling like they uh, they got hosed. The one two count was certainly you know falls right down the middle. If they got a challenge there, even though not going to challenge it in in college baseball. But then you know watching the Tigers again last night, and then you know the, that irrefutable video evidence stuff. Well, let's let's dive in. We only have uh, so many minutes with you. Your your time is so valuable. That <laughs> let's go to the big story this week, which was the Michigan athletic director who we heard from there at the start ward manual. He made some comments on collectives. You did a story on it and uh, you did another story that I would uh, encourage people to check out as well. Mason blue review. You had a series with a member of the Michigan regents, which was very telling on, on uh, admissions, on collectives, uh, you know, all the things that people are talking about. So whether you like it or not, Brandon, you've become like a, an expert in uh, NIL. What did you make of Ward's comments? Uh, he had a lot to say about NLI slash collectives in Michigan. Yeah, well, I think one thing is clear, and, and we'll start there. Michigan hears the dialogue that, that they're getting talked about, uh, that's getting talked about surrounding them. Uh, within the college football landscape and within college sports, I should say. And a lot of people have, have thought, especially within Michigan internally, um, not the program, but it's fans, I should say. So the fan base has really pushed back on uh, what Michigan has done for NIL and, and what they're doing for NIL. And uh, I think Michigan started to kind of hear that. And I think Ward Manuel felt that he had this opportunity with the podcast with Jansen to kind of clear the air on all of these things and, and really, um, I guess, kind of, set things straight and really go all in and tell all in a way. Um, some of those quotes were, were long and, and uh, extremely detailed and he really didn't, didn't hold much back. Um, I think that he did a, a, an excellent job of explaining to everyone how Michigan wants to go about NIL. And uh, here's the one thing. Uh, and I, and I read this on the board the other day is that, uh, we keep going back to this conversation about how Michigan needs to break the rules in order to compete. Uh, at the end of the day, Michigan is never going to be that sort of program uh, with Ward Manuel at the top. And I would say if it weren't Ward, no matter who it, who it was, the Board of Regents would never oversee that. Nobody in, within that university and that institution would let like a wrongdoing that's really damning fly. Right. Like that's, that's just not going to happen here. And I remember when we were talking about NIL back in you know, October and or November, whatever that was. And uh, we started to discuss how it was kind of a slow play for Michigan. And when I talked to Jordan Acker and he's a, the uh, chair of the board of regents for uh, University of Michigan. And when, when we had the interview with him, his dialect was really like, hey, we're doing a lot of good things, um, but we're never going to do the stuff we're not supposed to do. So when we were when we were originally talking about it, I, I thought and you remember this just like off of a hunch. I thought to myself, okay, Michigan is a cross your T's, dot your I's school. It always has been. So just reading the trends and covering this program and covering this university for uh, the years that I have, not many, but you know, enough to, to gather these kinds of things. I figured that was the case. They were just making sure this whole thing was going to be sustainable uh, and that this was going to be done the right way and that they weren't going to make things happen right now. That wasn't going to help them down the road or hurt them. Uh, down the road, uh, conversely. So, and that's exactly, and, and when I was talking with, with Jordan Acker about it, he replied with like, that's, that's pretty much how we went about it was we wanted to build something sustainable and make something happen. And the beautiful city of Trenton, Michigan always provides the, um, city sounds during the show, whether it's the cat or the car. Uh, but anyway, you know, Acker really like confirmed that, that that was the case for Michigan. This was a, a long process. They wanted to make sure it was going to work. They wanted to make sure it was sustainable and it's still going. And, and Ward more or less confirmed all of that in a story he did in the podcast he did with Jansen. And when we wrote up on his quotes, uh, that's pretty much how he put it was that, and, and it's just one of those things where people have to like come to terms with the fact that Michigan isn't going to push boundaries when it comes to rule breaking. It's just not how they do business. However, there's still a lot of ways in NIL. It's not like recruiting where in the past where it's just like, hey, bag man or bust. Like you're either going to pay the kid 
and get them or you're not. And like, that's how you cheat. Right. And then there's like those little tiny things where it's like, oh, you're texting at the wrong time or whatever. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to dive into any of that, but as far as like paying players goes, like that's, that was egregious. That was like a, a, a fine line that everyone saw. It was, it was right there in front of you. NIL is far different. NIL, you can actually play an even playing field with these guys while not pushing buttons. Why? Because people can still make or players and student athletes can still make money for what they've earned at your school under legal <laughs> direction. So it's just one of those things where I feel like uh, on Michigan side of things and what we've heard from them between Acker and Manuel, they're all about this. And the the misconception is that they're not, that they don't like it. They're all for it. They're, they're making it happen. They're just going to do it the right way uh, and maximize the potential of it while still staying uh, within the guidelines. Yeah, I think Michigan, this is what I think, and this is what I hope. And this is not what I've thought all along, because even as recently as whatever it was two weeks ago when Jim Harbaugh said that Michigan, and we know that he really thought about what he was going to say about name, image, and likeness, and he came out and said Michigan's going to be transformational rather than transactional. He can say that, and Ward Manuel can talk about uh, inducements and everything else, but however Michigan wants to go about it, they need to relay to a player. If you don't want to say it's a guaranteed money, if you don't want to say it's upfront money, you don't want to say it's inducement. But when it comes to a guy like Dante Moore, who's going down to college station uh, in Texas this year in, or this week and, and he's going to be down there with Jimbo Fisher and everything else, those guys that run their collective, maybe it's not Jimbo, but Jimbo's going to say, Hey, Dante, we're going to let you in the door with a couple of these guys. And these guys are going to come in and say, yeah, Dante, we're, you got three, four million dollars here. And Michigan just needs to relay when whenever he, they talk to Dante Moore, like, yeah, we're not giving you the money up front, but here's the opportunity to make it. And right. the opportunity can be in quote quotations, which might as well be upfront money. It's a very small gap to me between promising and saying you have the opportunity. And and I look at the, the two uh, offensive linemen driving around in a car recently. Uh, th- that imagery to me. You're telling recruits out there that you can have a car and, you know, you're not promising the car, but you can say, here's the car. And, you know, it's the same thing. It's different than it was before. You're not sliding briefcases to, you know, your, your uncle's best friend or you know, sliding cash under the table. Now you're just saying, uh, and, and a lot of it is just how you frame it. No, or we're not promising or guaranteeing you money. We're just talking about the opportunity. That's what I think Michigan's got going. And, and they're they're saying all this, you know, the, the, to you know, not to make themselves sound good, but you know, the, technically, you know, you, you can't go out there and promise things. So, but I think behind the scenes, that Michigan is going to be competitive. That that's the hope. What do you what do you think of that? I think that's absolutely their goal is to they they first of all they know that they that they need to compete with NIL. They know that NIL is um, not something that is negotiable for them to pursue. They know that if they're going to stay relevant at the top of college sports, which they were damn near director's cup champions this year, uh, falling behind Texas and finishing second. So they understand how much of a prestige their athletics is at now. And they, but they also understand that if they don't build a sustainable, uh, you know, program within NIL, that's going to have longevity to it uh, and a plan, uh, both long and short term, then their relevancy is going to take a decline. Right. Because if, if Michigan doesn't pursue NIL right here, right now, maybe they're not affected right here, right now as much. Maybe they're still good at football this season. They're, maybe their juniors and seniors throughout their university are still going to perform at in other athletics. But they understand if they don't start to uh, build this foundation with NIL now, then when these classes who are kind of like the NIL boomers, almost like baby boomers, but with NIL, right, where they're all every, all of a sudden everyone's all about like trying to figure out NIL and trying to get in and yada, yada, yada. They understand if they don't have something prepared now for, for those classes, when they get here, they'll fall off gradually and gradually and gradually and gradually. Um, so they understand how important this is. They get that this is a non-negotiable uh, among the Michigan administrators to make NIL a priority within their athletic programs. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's going to happen. It is happening. And I think that Ward Manuel coming out and, and telling all, quote unquote, is a sign that they're trying to, not only are they trying to build this internally, but they're trying to let people know, like, like, hey, I don't think you understand how this whole NIL thing really works. So here's the A, B, and C behind it, and here's the X, Y, and Z of what we're going to do at the end of it. And uh, 
come along for the ride. So it's to me, it's like Michigan from a common sense perspective, Michigan is doing all, all it can do to build something sustainable. That's long-term. They're not doing these flashy deals. They're not like doing the million dollar car dealership stuff a month into your, a month into your uh, school year and then transferring out the next month to Texas. That's not happening. Right. They don't have to worry. And so the schools that did try to do that, let's think about it. The schools that, that did that, like Ohio State, who I just referenced with the Quinn Ewers thing, 1.2 million. He's only there for two months and then he's back to Texas. And what did you do for it? And what did Ohio State lose from it? Will Ohio State ever get that dealership to get involved in another NIL deal? These are all things to consider. Michigan's not burning bridges. Michigan's not, uh, I think, hurting their reputation. Because if you don't think people looked at Ohio State with a negative light over the Ewers thing, then you're wrong. Because everyone saw that and he made Ohio State look silly. Um, so I I think they're doing a good job, man. I don't know how else to say that. You, you, people might think that's like biased or uh, a brown nosing. I just, I look at this from a logical, even killed perspective and I see the long term, and I see the sustainability and I compare it to the other NIL programs around the country. I see how much they're doing for every athlete from, from the high ends, like the JJs and all the way down to, you know, the, not so much the walk-ons as much, but you know, the more of the PWOs, those guys are still doing things, right? So they're taking care of their guys and, and girls. And I think that's what matters. And the sustainability is what's going to end up being the difference maker and the X factor in their programs compared to others. Well, so far, what I've seen from you when you talk or when you write, you're just uh, giving your opinion and you're, you're not looking to fan the flames uh, or, you know, trying to get uh, just hits. You know, you're, you're telling it like it is. Now, I got to pick up the tempo because I, I said uh, I was only going to keep you for 15 minutes. It's past 20. Oh, you're fine. I got, I got no three worries. things for you. I'm going to go to the feedback with Antoine. I've got something on recruiting and something on baseball. So. We'll do this fast. We'll have uh, just a minute response. Here's the feedback from uh, Antoine. It's a it's a, uh, a double decker here. He says chances are college football won't hand out any penalties because everyone is doing NIL deals, either legit or not. College football would have to penalize the whole league. He said he never did like NIL because I knew it would happen. Anybody with common sense could see the trouble coming, but you have to do it or uh, left behind. He thinks college football should treat this actually what it is, a business, and start giving contracts to have structure. Other than that, we will have chaos. What do you think? Uh, I think that would cause more chaos because when you start contractually binding kids to things besides their scholarships, it starts to become real messy. At that point, you're not even having student-athletes anymore. They're just athletes. And um, the NCAA's purpose, I know that it, the NCAA has its flaws, but the purpose of – college sports is giving athletes an opportunity to put their skills on the showcase to either move on to the professional ranks or go into the professional world. And by being a student athlete, you get, you get a maximized opportunity at both by getting your uh, degree and and playing uh, for the, for the team. So I just think that that completely um, takes away from what college sports are. And I don't think NIL does. I think NIL perfectly marries it. It allows players to capitalize on their value in today's modern day and age and, um, much like many things on earth, which I won't dive into because that would be a whole other conversation. Things need to be evolved over time and modernized. And so I understand that when NIL came about, um, it was going to shake things up, but I think it's it, it, on the surface when it, as it gets more constructed and, and Antoine, I agree, there are some things that need to be ironed out and some, some corners that need to be edged and all that. Don't get me wrong. I just think that when you think about this NIL thing, like all it's doing is allowing players to manage themselves and to maximize themselves. Um, Michigan can bring in collectives like, you know, Valiant is providing a ton. Um, you know, M. Dow is supposed to be an NFT marketplace for them. We'll see. I mean, I know that that's kind of a messy subject right now, but see how that plays out. Um, and there's other things involved there. And so Michigan's allowed to work with, uh, you know, influencer, the app where they're able to connect to them. But really a lot of this is um, kind of like athlete dependent. Like a lot of these guys are making their own, uh, waves in the NIL and and having fun doing it and because, taking ownership in themselves and like their own um, business, which is almost like a, not so much like a self proprietor, but you're almost becoming self employed and, and making money for yourself by finding different brands. Now, Michigan, of course, um, can assist in that department, but a lot of these kids, like think about JJ McCarthy and the camp that he ran in uh, less than a month ago out in Chicago, uh, the big mega camp, I think they called it because they couldn't use the copyright of the Big Ten champs. Right so it was there. a big. Yeah, big champs. Mega. Yes, I was there. And um, JJ, if you're watching this, we should do that interview. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> I got to tell you that story, Dennis. Um, 
So anywho, he did that all himself with his dad's help. But I mean, that was entirely him. Michigan didn't call in and set that thing up. He did that on his own. Right. And so a lot of these kids are able to do that. And so you, you got Dante Moore on the screen. I know we're going to dive into him, but um, you know, Dante Moore is, is being presented with, with brands that are willing to work with him and all of that and everything when he, if, and when, you know, NIL uh, becomes an opportunity for him at whichever school he goes to. And so he knows the brands that he can work with already without even being there, I would imagine. Uh, and that's without any help from the school itself. He just kind of has a name for himself, but the school itself, obviously, Helps too. All I'm trying to, what I'm trying to point out, Antoine, what I'm trying to do to answer your question here is that this, the cha- the chaotic side of it comes from contractually binding these kids to their deals and contractually binding them to many things. And then it kind of like poisons the uh, foundation of what college sports is. But Dennis, you were going to say something. Well, I was going to give a shout out to the UFM club of greater Detroit who hooked up Charles Woodson to come in there and give a talk at that McCarthy oh, yeah. camp. Somebody reached out and told me that uh, they were behind that. And uh, I just wanted to make a point about Ward Manuel. Besides playing golf all the time, uh, Ward also sits on a lot of uh, Zooms and committees and subcommittees, and I'm sure Kevin Warren has been in a few of those. And if you you listen closely to that podcast, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of times that he's pointing out that these guys are not paid employees, that they do not want them to be you know just employees. Uh, that is something that is going to cross the line that they don't want to see. Uh, it, they want to separate themselves from the name, image, and likeness. Michigan is academics. The name, image, and likeness, they can't do anything about. He said that a number of times, too. Uh, but, you know, they do have to work behind the scenes in Harmony, which is a weird thing. That's why it's it's not perfectly set where this means this. And, oh, wait, he can't really talk, but we know that they are actually talking, uh, which, you know, makes it a little bit strange. But that's where we're at. Uh, Dante Moore is visiting Texas A&M. I know this, if Michigan somehow lands Dante Moore and, and he hasn't said when he's going to make an announcement or even trim his list or any of that, but that would answer any questions for me about name, image, and likeness because Dante Moore, uh, Texas A&M, Phil Knight in Oregon, LSU, and what they – all of those teams are going to be offering, whether you want to say opportunities or straight-up signing bonuses, it's going to be in the seven figures. It might be $2 million, It might be $3 million. So if somehow Michigan does land Dante Moore, I'm not going to cry or say anything about any name, image, and likeness. They will have proof that, uh, you know, that they are there and they're in the mix. And the fact will be that they would have been able to deliver a guy like Dante Moore, who we know is being offered uh, big sums of uh, money up front. Yeah. I mean, Dante Moore is, if you're watching this, I would imagine you know who he is. He's this five-star protege type of top 10 recruit uh from michigan's backyard at detroit king um has all the makings of a of a, of a professional quarterback does things uh like the decision making and his touch on the short to medium stuff is, is real elite uh working on the deep field stuff but has the opportunity uh to be a, a legendary quarterback wherever he's at but especially at michigan where he's from uh, and, and where he kind of grew up and, and the school that he's kind of quote unquote flirted with the longest but you asked this question a month or so ago and you're starting to think like he's a hundred percent going to Notre Dame. Um, and, and you're really thinking if it's not Notre Dame, it certainly isn't going to be Michigan, uh, with some other schools in the mix there too. Um, but Michigan really capitalized on the opportunity with the visit. Um, seemed like, and, and don't quote me on this, but, uh, seemed like the whole CJ Carr thing was really going to help Michigan with Dante Moore because he ends up going to Notre Dame where we kind of had, thought Dante Moore was going to end up and slot at. Uh, but but CJ Cargos Notre Dame and Michigan's like, hey look man, like we're not trying to get both of you in here at the same time. We're just trying we're we, we want you. We're we're gonna zero in on you. And Michigan saw this window where they were like, well, it's one or the other. We know Michigan likes quarterbacks in the 24 class better than Carr, like Jaden Davis. And uh, you know, if Carr decides to reclassify to the 2023 class, uh, Dante Moore and, and CJ Carr are two guys that don't want to be in the same room in the same class at the same time. Because again, I know that there's probably some old schoolers watching this or some new schoolers watching it that are just, that have old school mentality where you're thinking like, Oh, competition, competition. Like I'm all about that 110%. But in college sports today, so much of this has to be logical. Like that's an emotional thought to want to go somewhere to beat somebody out is an emotional thought to go somewhere where, where you have, where you clearly have a better window of opportunity to play uh, and, and, you know, academic programs, environment facilities, all of those things too. NIL, all those things included, but 
you know, what it, what it boiled down to was I don't think both of those guys were end, going to end up here. And I think CJ wants to play um, sooner than, than Michigan expects him to. So, uh, you know, and I don't know if that's going to be pulled off either, but at the end of the day, I mean, Dante Moore was who they zeroed in on and, and they had an opportunity to kind of prioritize CJ Carr, but they, they didn't down the stretch. And that's what inevitably motivated him to just make his decision when he did rather than waiting. Um, and, and Michigan decided on Dante Moore that this is going to be our guy. So they're going to live by the sword and die by the sword in the 23 class uh, with Dante Moore. And as things stand, they look good. Um, but Texas A&M and, and Ohio State and plenty of other visits ahead for him. And uh, I don't know how long this this will drag out. Uh, but they're in a much better spot today than they were a month ago. And that's the thing is we had this whole recruiting panic talk like, what, two months ago where everyone was just on the panic button. I think, feel like people still are. Um, but they have a big weekend with Dante Moore last weekend. And then this past weekend, they have a big weekend with several guys. And all of a sudden, we're starting to turn that switch again. And here comes Michigan. They're going to recruit, and everyone can calm down. <laughs> well, if they get to July 4th and they haul in some big-time players, uh, the panic will just go to uh, concern. Uh, the DEFCON will, instead of going to three, it'll be at uh, two or whatever. Okay. Uh, speaking, as we have today, about deals and Ward Manual, and baseball, we have the Michigan baseball coach, uh, Eric Backich, and he is being uh, pursued by Clemson. And the chances that uh, that Backich, uh, you, uh, you've been typing out thousands of words, maize and blue review, about uh, the scenarios here. Uh, give us the Reader's Digest about um, uh, Backich and the possibility that um, he stays or goes. So this all started uh... – Let's take you back to the regular season, and, and I'll make this a, a quick, like you said, reader to digest. Uh, I got all day. You know, I, I know. I know I'm a rambler sometimes, Dennis. Don't you worry. Uh, I'm not great for radio. Uh, so, anywho, uh, we'll take it back to the regular season, and Michigan's struggling big time. The team, the team ERA is eclipsed seven at, at one point, and um, was historically bad for them. I mean, we're talking like bottom 250 in the country out of not too many more teams than 250. Um, Tigers, so Michigan knew. Yeah, go ahead. If they can even roster anybody at this point, I might show up and, and start today's game. So uh, the plan to uh, move on from the pitching coach, Steve Merriman, was already in set. And uh, you could tell that was evident when Backage was taking all the mound visits um, in the Big Ten postseason and the NCAA tournament. And traditionally speaking, your assistant coach, your pitching coach, takes the first mound visit. And then when you make the switch to the pen, your head coach come in, comes in, but Backage was taking all of them. So we kind of noticed that heard some things about Merriman that uh, he, they were possibly moving on from him. And then when we saw the mound visits, you're starting to wonder, okay, well, he's not really present at this time. And then sure enough off the website and, you know, we've confirmed a few things and Michigan is moving on from, from Merriman. And then uh, Brandon Inge, the volunteer assistant coach who, again, I want to make it clear volunteer assistant coaches, they, they get paid. And, you know, a lot of guys who are pursuing coaching full-time will start as volleys. Talk about Eric Backage. He started as a volley at, uh, Clemson, very common. Um, and I, fun fact, I was Valley at Saginaw Valley State for a brief second. So, anywho, uh, they inch steps down. He doesn't want to coach college anymore. He's got a kid who's a junior at Country Day, uh, a couple other kids too. So, he's going to step away from coaching. So, now all of a sudden, you've got Eric Backage and his sidekick all this time, uh, who is Nick Schnabel, the assistant head coach, associate head coach, and infielders. And uh, he's he runs point recruiting. And you know, Michigan baseball is not Michigan baseball with Nick, without Nick Schnabel. So, if you if you haven't paid much attention, to Michigan baseball over the years, and you're wondering about the construct of the coaching staff, like it's Backage and Schnabel's show. Uh, and, you know, Fetter was the guy who made pitching what it was, but as far as the team energy and, and the culture, it's those two guys. Um, so it's hard to imagine those two wanting to split up the band, so so to say. So when Clemson comes into play, was they fire Monty Lee, and Michigan um, was able to keep Backage in 2016 when Clemson kind of flirted with him a little bit, but ended up going with Monty Lee. They fire Monty Lee after seven seasons. Five seasons after five seasons. Uh, and then I immediately, I'm talking like immediately identify Backage as their top guy. Um, there's history there. Backage was the volunteer assistant coach there in 02 uh, with Tim, Hor Tim Corbin, who was a full time assistant head coach or assistant coach. Corbin goes to Vanderbilt. Backage goes with him. Backage, seven years later, ends up at Maryland as a head coach and then ends up at Michigan. So uh, these two, Backage and Schnabel, um, that's where things kind of are going to get interesting because with Clemson, 
Beckett's is their guy, 100%. They're not going to budge. They're going to do anything they can to get him. The, the number right now is a million. Um, I could see it being a million plus incentives. I could be see it being more than a million plus more incentives because this is really who they want and, and who they believe is going to get there. And there is history there for him. Again, started there in 02, but coached under Jack Leggett, who he's lasted or who has a relationship with him that's lasted years after um, and, and one of the mentors. And at one point in like the early 2010s, 33% of the SEC's head coaches were Jack Leggett protégés, like they had started under Jack Leggett. Uh, and I don't know what the number is now, but I would imagine it's higher as a, as a, as a nation, uh, looking at every single coaching staff. Um, so that means a lot to him. Clemson means a lot to him. Uh, Backage is from Cali, from San Jose, but he he played baseball at Eastern Carolina, immediately went to Clemson thereafter, and went to Tennessee. This guy has been in the South. Baseball is in the South. Um, and then you start to look at that side of it, where it's Clemson, and he's in a recruiting hotbed. The Carolinas have fantastic baseball, but not to mention they're bordering Georgia and they're right by Florida, which are two of the top three states in, in the country for baseball, too. Um, so while Michigan is trending upwards in, in recruiting in baseball recruiting, it's surely not Georgia, Florida or the Carolinas. So he gets a recruiting hotbed. He gets a, uh, a program that is a revenue for Clemson, like baseball makes money at Clemson and, and in the ACC. Uh, he's in a conference that's unequivocally better than the Big Ten. He's year in, year out contending for a national championship. He's not really playing that underdog role like he is at Michigan where they're just making runs in the postseason, which he's having fun doing and, and, and all that. But, uh, again, it's a whole different beast at Clemson. you got to think about it like that. This wouldn't be selling out because he does have connections there, and, and Clemson does mean something to him and his family and all of that. So I wouldn't so much say selling out. Um, but when you've been somewhere for 10 years, which is how long he's been at Michigan, when you've been somewhere for uh, 10 years or going on 10 years next year because he got here in 13 um, – you start to think about like, what if I went somewhere else? And I know we had this conversation about Harbaugh and Harbaugh was going to the NFL. So it was uh, a lateral move as far as head coaching goes. This is probably, I wouldn't say maybe, maybe not an equal lateral move from going from college to pros, but it's pretty freaking close. I mean, you're talking premier prestige ACC program. Uh, if you're playing like NCAA baseball, like this is a five-star program, Michigan more like three-star, four-star. And only reason they're up, up to this pedigree is because of package. So um, and then you talk about the payday, man, like the million plus. Now, on Michigan side of things, Ward Manuel wants to keep him. Uh, 110% Ward Manuel, I was told today by a source, is actively trying to keep Backage around. He's, he's looking at every way possible to keep Backage around. Uh, and if he can uh, make it make sense, then he will keep him. Uh, I was told by a different source than the one I just mentioned, this was more so on Michigan side, that money is, is not a problem. Michigan is not worried about matching an offer. Michigan is thinking about if it makes sense for them to match an offer for a non-revenue sport. Uh, Ward Manuel, I was told, again, this is verbatim, prudent, knows his talent, understands what he has in package, is going to do everything he can to keep him, but it has to make sense for Michigan to keep him, right? Does it make sense to pay your to pay your non-revenue baseball coach $1.1 I don't know, right? I don't know. This this team has fantastic postseasons, but they haven't had the best regular seasons at times. Um, but they've still night and day to this program. That's unquestionable and unequivocal. In a perfect world, Michigan never has to worry about losing package. They would never get rid of him if they didn't have to. Um, so that's where we're at right now is we're kind of in this like standstill, this face off in a way where Clemson, a Clemson has caught wind that manual is doing everything he can. And the reason that manual has taken so much action is because he caught wind that Clemson was in that $1 million number. Uh, and I originally heard that on the baseball side of things, but then got it confirmed on the Michigan side of things. And so, uh, now we're in this like standoff where does Clemson wait till after the college world series? And do they do a full interview type of, um, routine where they talk to every everyone that's in their uh, candidacy or do yeah, they make a quick starts. move do they make a quick move and go straight for their guy do they go straight for backage aggressive and put michigan against the wall and make them make a move conversely does michigan sit around and wait for clemson to kind of make their move and then counter or do they aggressively do everything they can to extend him i'll tell you one thing either way backage is getting more money next year whether it's with michigan or whether it's with clemson he's going to get more money next year that's that's not a question uh the question is does ward value it enough to keep him here and at the end of the day what does backage want to do because i was told by a source the same source from what i mentioned earlier that it's not going to come down for money for backage it's not going to be a bidding war type of deal if he wants to go to clemson it's because he wants to be there and if he wants to stay at michigan it's because he wants to stay here it's going to be a family decision it's going to be a career decision for him again family career you talk about 10 years being here you talk about his family being here for 10 years do they want to stay they want to go. So a lot of things to consider if you're if you're coach package. And at the end of the day, uh, it's been a consensus that this is the ball is in his court and that Ward is willing to do whatever he wants to keep him here uh, so long as it makes sense financially. And then conversely, Clemson will do anything to get him there. 
So really the world is in his hands and it's what he wants to do with it. And I know that it sounds silly, but that's as simple as it boils down to. Uh, and that's kind of where we're at is this little, this little standoff where we're, we're going to figure out who comes out on top. But right now it's been mostly radio silence from, uh, you know, the, the in, internal look at the coaching search. Well, here I was talking about joking about uh, Ward just playing golf every day, but he's got this baseball thing to deal with. He's got the hockey thing to deal with. It's not like he's just sitting around playing golf all day long. You know, he might, <laughs> he might be able to get 18 in, but he's got a lot of things to, uh, a lot of things to do. He can't just sit around celebrating that, uh, that football big 10 championship. Like uh, maybe I thought that he would be able to do. He's got some things going on. You do as well. That's great work uh, all day long, all night long. Days in Blue Review. Uh, great job. Look forward to talking with you again, Brandon. Oh, and before we go, yeah. shout, out to Coach, shout out to Coach Ryan Kelly, Wayne State Baseball. Just want to make sure I give him a shout out. RK is a legend. Last time I was on here, he was on the show, and I forgot to shout him out before I left. So I got I to gotta write my wrongs there. So shout out to Wayne State Baseball. Historical year. There you go. Uh, Brandon Justice, senior editor, Mason Blue Review. We'll be back tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Michigan football today. Till then, everybody have themselves a great day. It's going to be a hot one tomorrow. That's for sure.